Seneca, Seneca, Sen, Sen, Seneca. You'll hopefully understand why I said that in a moment. Hello, everyone. This is your weekly Thursday look at the history of mental health and psychology. Unlike most weeks, this is a full history of history episode for everybody, Patreon subscribers and non, just you normal brainiacs listening to the show out there. Uh, as you know, probably, I do this once a month where I do a little history episode for everybody. They are uh, available weekly with a little sample, usually for everybody. But uh, once a month, I do one that is focused on everyone and is for everyone. And this week, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the concept of anger management. I'll, I'll be really transparent with you. One of the reasons I've actually been studying about anger management anyway is that I'm starting an anger management course that is going to be available, uh, you know, online. It's a pre-recorded course with, with both uh, anger management skills and also a look at some of the underlying issues that are causing people's anger which is kind of one of the things that's a little different about how I do it. I like to look at anger management as, uh, through the lens of addiction as well, which we often don't talk about. But I'll, I'll talk about that later. So there's a little shameless self-promotion for you as well. But let's get into why I said Seneca. Take yourselves back to the Roman Empire, if you will. While we're on the subject, one of the great Roman philosophers back at that time was a man named, guess what? Seneca. You got it. Bonus points for anyone who guessed that. He was an early philosopher who uh, uh, helped to found the idea of Stoicism. So those Stoics or <laughs> those that are into philosophical Stoicism, you kind of have you probably heard of him if you if you would call yourself a Stoic philosopher or Stoicistic. Is that how y'all say it? Probably not. But either way, Seneca was one of the early uh, founders and uh, theorists, philosophers about this kind of thing. He has a famous essay called On Mercy that is the first example of some of that Stoic thought. Uh, there, apparently that, that led to uh, something that was known as the Mirror of the Prince Literature. And you all know I had to look that one up, <laughs> which it became a literary genre uh, known as Mirror of Princes, or sometimes Mirror of Princesses, apparently. Uh, and, and basically what it is is a approach to literature, I guess, that outlines basic principles of conduct for rulers and the structure and purpose of secular power, often in relation either to a transcendental source of power or to abstract legal norms. As far as I can tell, that would mean morals or ethics or perhaps even spiritual-based values that are there. And by the way, I just said that for memory. Now, that was actually from the Encyclopedia Britannica literature section of that is where I got that from. Because, yeah, I, I, when I read something like Mirror of Princes Philosophy, I, I just had to look that up. That is, however, not what we're talking about. The reason why I'm mentioning Seneca is that he was apparently one of the first to study, talk, and write about anger. Um, he lived from uh, 4 BC to 65 uh, AD, apparently. And although uh, I, I can't find any evidence here that he used the term anger management. In fact, that was originated much later in like the 70s. We'll get to that in a minute here. But uh, it could be considered anger management. He talked about identifying, avoiding becoming angry, and dealing with anger in not only yourself, but other people. There was also um, a couple other philosophers at that time took interest in that. Galen was one who was another Roman era uh, philosopher. And there is record of uh, a philosopher, another Stoic philosopher, named Athenodorus Canaanites, apparently, who counseled the ruler Octavian to actually recite the alphabet before acting out in anger. That was uh, Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus, this was who Octavius apparently was. I, I don't know much about the Roman Empire. This has been very interesting to kind of uh, uh, go down there. But uh, interestingly enough, some of that approach survives till today. If you think of this as a distraction technique from anger, or basically trying to slow down what, uh, you know, what is happening internally before we make external choices. So that'll be interesting to see the thread here of how that goes. 
Incidentally, if you'd like to know more about any of those philosophers, particularly Seneca, there's a great article entry on him in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So go to that, plato.stanford.edu, um, and then look up Seneca if you are so inclined. Interesting uh, guy in and of his own right. Uh, some other important names you might want to look up in the development of this. And funny enough, when you look at the history, it jumps. I found I found that a lot of it jumps right to more modern times. But there's a, a certain Peter Stearns, who apparently is Sir Peter Stearns. Mm, good for him. Uh, who studied anger and particularly the way that it expressed itself socially between uh, – oh, well, actually between the sexes. One of the really interesting things is there's a, a peer of his – uh, June Crawford, and they had different kind of opinions. He researched and said that anger pretty much held a lot of the same qualities across the gender gap as far as men and, and women. Uh, June Crawford, who studied this, uh, in, and you can read more about her work at um, the Australian Psychologist is where I found her, at APS. Uh, it's uh, APS.com or APS.OnlineLibrary.com. Uh Anyway, you can see she wrote a, a work on this back in the 90s, Women Theorizing Their Experiences of Anger, a Study Using Memory Work. And she actually felt that there was a pretty strong difference between the expression of anger in men and women. Uh, particularly, the, some of the differences I found she wrote about was uh, male anger being related to anger at perceived injustice, slights, uh, and, and certain types of threats, whereas uh, anger in regards to uh, fear, hurt, and suppression was a little bit more common in women. Now, she would write, and I you know, think a lot of people would theorize that this has a lot to do with the socialization that we are exposed to as men and women in a lot of, uh, you might say, traditional societies or traditional Western societies. I don't know how you want to look at that. A lot, a lot of uh, – you know, a lot of nations have had different socialization with men and women. So that's just an interesting thing to sort of chase down on your own. Um, one of the important researchers was Raymond Navaco, who in the 1970s is credited with coming up with the term anger management and using that in sort of a, a, a noun, you know, in, in the sense of like, this is a thing that we can teach. He introduced some uh, ideas of talking about the Underlying emotional responses, as well as the external uh, influences that trigger anger. And this gets into a lot of the modern approach of anger management, which is based off a lot of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And if you've listened to past uh, history episodes, rational emotive behavioral therapy, what we call uh, CBT what we call <laughs> CBT nowadays has a lot of its roots with a rational emotive behavioral therapy as well. They're kind of fused together, if you remember me talking about Albert Ellis and some of those things. But basically, it brings into account both our thoughts and our emotions and how they influence our behavior. The modern kind of approach to treatment for anger management would sort of lend itself to that as well. And you can see roots of this back in uh, Novako's research that he did you know, back in the 70s. Like so many things, anger was mainly thought of and, and still often is thought of as a moral issue. If you lose your temper, you're a bad person kind of a thing. And when it is much more complicated than that, a bad person and a good person can both lose their temper, uh, if you will. We'll get into, I don't know, we'll get into what, what is a good or a bad person. Here's the thing. Things are complicated much more than that, not always black and white. But the idea psychologically that anger could be broken down into elements of the influence of where that was coming from. Uh, basically, a lot of that breaks down like this. If you have an external event that happens, that external event will filter through the cognitive beliefs and, and thoughts that you have, as well as the emotions attached to those thoughts, beliefs, expectations uh, that are related to that. Best example that I like to use is just a flat tire. So imagine somebody going to work, you get a flat tire and you get out of the car and they find that obviously the tire's flat. Now, let's say they're driving to work. Now, all of a sudden they start to get upset and worried. They Maybe they pop the trunk. And what is the trunk full of? Well, it's full of stuff. So they're putting out stuff on the side of the road or throwing it in the back seat. You know, they pull up the the a little, whatever it's called, the flap on the floor of the trunk, if you will. You know, and then it's like, okay, do I even have a spare? I've never changed a tire in this car before. Does it have a good tool that will actually help me get the lug nuts off? Or does it have that stupid little, you know, 
I don't know, that, that little four to five inch long <laughs> little thing that is supposed to, to be a wrench that, boy, especially if this lug nut has not been open or, or loosened for a while, it's not doing, it's not doing anything. Is the jack intuitive to use or not intuitive to use? And by the way, do I have like a locking hubcap kind of cover? And where the hell is the key to open that thing? Okay, so I might as well just, you know, build a house here on the side of the road and just live here. Now, at this point, if someone was to pull over and walk up and they see this person, maybe they're upset, they're cussing, maybe they're chucking things or hitting the tire. Now, if this person has the unmitigated gall to say, hey, why are you so upset? The person is going to point at the tire and say, this is why I'm upset. They might add some choice other words about the intelligence level of the person who's asking them. Now, breaking down like anger management and cognitive behavioral and psychological theories about anger, it's not really the tire. What it is, is it's the thought processes, the expectations and beliefs that are attached to the tire, and then the level of emotional regulation and emotional moderation skills that the person has combined to equal a choice, the, the actions that we do. It's a choice to kick the tire and bang at the tire and swear at the tire. It doesn't feel like a conscious choice because these things happen very quickly. If I'm a person who believes I'm in trouble, if I'm late for work, my boss is going to fire me or everyone will think bad thoughts about me or I've already got my shirt all dirty and ruined and this is I'm supposed to meet with these clients today or whatever it is that I'm supposed to do. And maybe I'm legitimately... Uh, you know, inadvertently letting someone down on the other end? Are they waiting for me to pick them up somewhere important? And all of those things can contribute. Now, of course, one of the big beliefs uh, that would be in there is what kind of thoughts and expectations do I have about my ability to change a tire, whether I have the right tools or whether I have the skill and experience and the confidence. And now, as long as we're on the subject, let me ask you to toss your mind back to a Christmas story. Not the Christmas story, but the movie, A Christmas Story, with Ralphie and, you know, all that stuff, the Red Rider BB gun. And if you remember, there's a key scene there where the dad of the family, I think he's called My Old Man. I can't remember if he has a name. He probably does. He, uh, They're getting a Christmas tree, and he runs over a nail or something. Now, when his tire, he realizes they have a flat tire, he pulls the car over, he turns to his wife, checks his watch, and he says, time me. Right. So he is excited to get out there and see how fast he can change this tire. And we get a little funny voiceover saying like, oh, my old man considered himself to be a, you know, in the, the NASCAR pits or I don't think it's a NASCAR back then. But anyway, uh, basically the, that he's a, a racing mechanic kind of mindset of like, I'm going to get it out there and I'm going to do this. And and there's an expectation that this is almost like a hobby or a source of fun for this kind of do it yourselfer guy from the 1950s. And I will say, I shared this with a group once. It was a class that I was teaching about this topic. I shared that example. And somebody actually in the group, the the, the, the crowd person, said that they had that experience. It was someone who apparently, I, I believe they probably had worked as a mechanic. I don't know. I didn't know the person. This was not someone that I really got to know or anything, just someone in this, attending this, this uh, presentation. And he said that he often had lots of tools. If he's driving his truck, he had tons of tools and one of those big cool jacks, hydraulic type of jacks. And that if he got a flat tire, his claim was he'd be back on the road in five minutes. It was no big deal, really, other than just the annoyance of maybe having to replace the tire. But he was very, very confident that he could do this. So really, a flat tire didn't bother him at all. Now, the key there is that we find, of course, that anger is not universally the same experience for everybody. That's the whole point. And so the idea of anger management is if we can get in and sort of mess with the belief process, the thought process, and many, many anger management techniques are aimed at slowing down this process. Like I said before, you don't usually go, hmm, let me filter this experience through my thoughts and beliefs. Hmm. That's the sound people make when they're doing that purposefully. And then you say, I'm going to choose to lose it now, and you get all upset. That's not how you know we, we do that. It just happens like, boom, a quick train of events. So trying to slow that down and actually recognize what is going on. And, and many times the way that this happens, 
like in many other cognitive behavioral approaches to things, is that we will maybe journal or fill out a worksheet or kind of go through a series of questions about what do I believe, why was this a trigger, what did this do, and all those things uh, after the fact. You have to kind of start the idea of intervening with a thought and reframing the thought with looking at something after it happens. Even though in cognitive behavioral therapy they have a term called thought stopping, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I, I don't really like that term because I don't think thought stopping is actually possible, particularly not right out the gate. We oftentimes cannot stop because the reason for that is thoughts that pop in our head are not always choices. In fact, if they are reactive to a situation, they are never choices. They are something that happens. And in order to stop something, we need to have a little control over it. Now, ideally, the more that we practice reframing the thought after it's already happened, then what we're doing is we're really training our brain and training ourselves to have a different instinctual response eventually. But this takes time and repetition. That's why when you are trying to get better at anger, it's very important that you give yourself the proper leeway to allow yourself to go through this and, and notice that this is difficult. A key part in whether or not anger management is successful is sort of the reason of why we are engaged in it. I have found that a lot of people come into anger management uh, either for either through therapy or going to a class or reading a book, whatever it is. A lot of times they come to it because something has happened in their lives that made it uncomfortable to not do it. In other words, it felt risky or uncomfortable to not change. And oftentimes that comes in the form of some kind of a consequence or a, even a threat, you could say, or an ultimatum that has been given to the person. Most commonly, you can get that from a partner, a parent, a, a boss or a company, you, um, and oftentimes from a judge as well. So those are where those are kind of some of the, I won't say governing parties because our family hopefully is not governing us, uh, but those are areas in which people are highly motivated to make change, even if they were not necessarily that aware that there was a problem before. And because of that, one of the really difficult things is do we embrace that this is actually a problem or do we say that this entity or person in my life is crazy and maybe multiple of them all seem to be crazy? I don't have a problem. Another thing that masks the need for anger management is the fact that many times the things we get angry at, they're real. Most People don't walk around getting angry at something that's nothing. They see a leaf fall off a tree and they go get in a bar fight, right? No, usually it's something that is legitimately valid and can cause that. Now, there is obviously overreaction to things that maybe if we're in a healthy place, we wouldn't even get mad at. But there's a lot of justification for anger because it's often triggered by something we legitimately do not like that makes us less happy, that makes us feel unsafe or that reminds us of bad experiences. And this is actually where I kind of, and, and many people nowadays sort of are gravitating away from simply the recitation and memorization of skills to, to reframe anger and to work on it, which, which are still very important. I don't want to say moving away from, actually. I should say adding other things that have to do with emotional underpinnings, trauma response, and oftentimes even addiction. I don't know as many people. I, I like to bring that to it. To look at, I'm an addiction guy, as you guys know from hearing the show, but I like to look at that too because we get addicted to things that make us feel safe, that make us feel in control, and that are perceived, in the short term especially, to be effective. One of the reasons that uh, drugs and alcohol and other intoxicant kind of use is really, really hard to shake is not just because of the chemical uh, uh, bond the, and the dependence that we get from the substance. And that's why you can see some things that have no chemical ingestion, like gambling or something like that. I know there's a chemical response in your brain, yes. But basically what that is, uh, it, it, with things that are not necessarily chemically dependent and that don't form tolerance and dependence, uh, they do form strong habits, the addictive compulsive behaviors that's, and that's one of the reasons is because they often work. And when I say work, let's, let's be careful of that definition. They often work in the short term. If I become intoxicated, I feel better for a minute. Now, with many 
drugs and things eventually i'm i'm no longer trying to feel better but i'm trying to avoid feeling even worse because they eventually many drugs will start to provoke a bad response that does not feel effective however even if i get into a place where i'm just trying to avoid withdrawals i guess what it works i avoid withdrawals when i ingest the subject the 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 substance so the a couple of things there to keep in mind and i think anger is very much the same way because anger is an action-oriented emotion. It makes us want to do something. Many times, one of the underlying responses is sadness or anxiety. And when we have those feelings, sometimes when we just sit there and feel sad or feel anxious, even though that is very healthy, it's very threatening because there's this big part of us that's like, I don't know what to do with this. And the belief that I have to do something and have to take action will oftentimes move me into a place where I am full of shame or full of blame towards others a lot of times too. So I can hate on myself or I can hate on other people. And anger gives me an outlet to take it out on them or me oftentimes. Anger can be very, very dangerous when we're not uh, addressing it. It does uh, lead to the release of, of adrenaline, of cortisol, and not necessarily in healthy ways like when you are when you, you, when you work out or you, you are exercising or doing something that has a natural adrenaline to it, Oftentimes, that activity will also help to flush it away, so to speak. That's an overly simplistic, you know, neurochemical <laughs> discussion there. But, but basically, there are times where we experience, you've heard me talk about on the show with many of the guests, use stress, which does raise our adrenaline, our stress level. But there's also a natural outlet for that. Anger, yeah, it doesn't really do that. What it does is it, it, it causes, it's similar to if you put a car in park, start it up, and then floor it. Theoretically, it should have already been in park. A lot of car examples today, by the way. And I don't want to show off, but that's, you know, how you park a car. So anyway, you turn on and you floor it uh, while it's in, you know, park or neutral or something. And it's not good for the engine. And that's not good for our engine either. There is an interesting article on Medium, if you want to check that out, if you're on Medium, uh, by Anik Batamuliza. That's B-A-T-A-M-U-L-I-Z-A. Sorry, Anik, if you're listening, I think I said your name kind of wrong, uh, called The Four Roots of Anger, which is very interesting, speaking of the underlying feelings. Uh, what they identify in the article is, is the theory of these four roots that, that are common uh, in anger. First one is blame and shame, which I just mentioned. Uh, the second one is pride, which, you know, a bruised ego and things like that can also be very, very threatening. Uh, the, number three is insecurity. Anger is a great cover for that, by the way. Uh, if I seem angry and in control, then at least to myself, I might feel a little more confident because I think that I'm in control, especially if it, air quotes here, works. If people do what I want them to do because they're scared of me or because they want to avoid that, it's easy to trick myself into thinking that, uh, you know, that, that I have power in that moment. Uh, and then the fourth one that uh, he theorizes is dreams deferred or denied. And that's very interesting. I'll let you check out the article if you want to read more. But that's more. The others I was I was editorializing some of my things. Uh, but but he has this this idea that when we are unhappier, basically we are more likely to be angry. So that's very interesting. And I think I would I would agree with that. There's uh, many many different modalities and techniques. Basically, if you look at what, what people find is if you're looking at reducing the behavior that anger usually has, cognitive behavioral therapy is highly recommended and studies show is very effective. And I'll be honest, most of the programs that you see out there are based almost solely on CBT. There's aggression replacement therapy. Uh, there, there's uh, just basically there's a lot of them out there. And they all are basically go back to the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, a couple of other things that have entered the stage over the years is uh, dialectical behavioral therapy is also a skill building. It has most of its roots in CBT uh, as well, but it, it also has kind of a deeper appreciation of emotion and maybe even a deeper understanding of the difficulties of emotional regulation. So not only do you have direct anger management skills in DBT, but you also have sort of adjacent emotional management skills, which also should help with that as well. And you all know that I'm a big fan of a lot of the DBT skills work, um, but that's, that's another one that I teach and, and have courses, you know, and things that I've worked on with that with people as well. A lot of the modern trauma techniques that I hit all the time on here uh, on the show as well, EMDR, internal family systems, once again, they're sort of adjacent. They, they may attack the, the, 
the feeling right on. But generally speaking, they're kind of looking more at the emotional parts that are activating that. Or in the case of EMDR, you're basically looking at uh, self-belief statements that your mind and you know, maybe making that you've been conditioned or experience has, has caused uh, you to think certain ways and things. So you're actually addressing some of those thoughts, and then you go through the MDR exercises to try to process that emotion differently. And once again, similar to how in cognitive behavioral approaches, you try to slow it down, distract. EMDR does this on a sort of a deeper, more emotion-based level. Not just, it's not not a behavioral thing. You don't get tips like hey, go do this when you're home. It's more like in session we process the uh, the emotions right then and there with uh, bilateral stimulation. And you can go back and hear many of the articles that <laughs> and, uh, I, and podcast episodes and things that I've shared about that as well. And, and that's a good thing to look up and get into too. So those are things that would be the difference being that cognitive behavioral therapy is engaging, often very successfully, engaging with the behaviors of anger. And then you've got these other techniques that go at sort of the underlying emotional responses and triggers and trying to alter a little bit how we feel. I am a fan of blending both of those personally because I think if you don't have one, you miss out on something. And if you don't have the other, same. You know, you basically you need to have an approach like that. Um, so... There you go. A little bit for you about anger management. hope that's interesting and helpful for everybody. On uh, next Tuesday, we'll have another uh, episode interview coming up. And since it's August, I want to mention uh, two little things. One is, is that August 29th, we're having the third annual Broken Brain five-hour live stream for International Opioid Overdose Awareness Day. That's going to be happening. For the exact times, and I, I broke it out into the time zones for uh, – it's mostly in the, the U.S. and Canada, basically, in this this part of the world. Uh, you can add or subtract other hours. It just wasn't room on the flyer to list everything. So you can find that. It's going to be midday on that Thursday. Go to DwightHurst.com slash live to find that. And I will say also the week – uh, of that and, and the day of particularly, there will also be a link where if you click that link, you will join the live feed, sort of like a live call in thing. And I uh, had a lot of people join last year and it was it was really a lot of fun as well as informative. And hopefully there's some inspiration there, too. This year, the theme that, that I've selected is relapse prevention and relapse uh, response when a relapse does happen. So and also ways to kind of maintain sobriety. So a lot of it is about the dynamics of addiction and intoxicant abuse, but a lot of it is actually going to be about building healthy behaviors. And so I will say, if you're wondering if you have something to contribute, you do, yeah, because you know how to be healthy for yourself and things that you've learned and observed and things that you would like to do or that you do do. Pardon me for saying do do. But uh, please, please join and share some of those things. You'll also be able to follow on social media and you can make comments there if you'd rather do that than jump on yourself. The uh, charity focused for August 2024 is Color Outside the Lines, which is a program helping youth in Oregon and California who, who lack access to opportunities and have been through maybe some bad experiences, many of which are in the foster care system, to learn to express themselves and find inspiration and healing through art. And that includes uh, the visual arts as well as music and dance and, and movement types of approaches. So go to coloroutsidelines.org if you'd like to learn more about them, participate or, you know, even give them some money. And uh, those of you who are not members of the Patreon, just to remind you, I know I say this every episode, but if you join the Patreon as a paid member, you get access to bonus materials, uh, like you get videos of all the interviews that we do, and also uh, you get these weekly history episodes and then, you know, bonus episodes as well that that come out on there. If you And if you do join... The charity that we're highlighting in the month that you join, so in other words, if you join in August, then half of your donation would go to Color Outside the Lines. The first of every month, it, I send out 50% of the donations to the various charities of when people join. So if you like that charity and it sounds good to you uh, then and you want to join, get the bonus materials, help out the show, and also help out that charity as well. And that that is... Uh, originally, I set that up as a six-month thing. I've decided to just extend it. And as long as you're on the Patreon and you're paying that, then then it, you, half your donation will always go to that charity of choice as long as you're a member. All right. That's all for now. 
Thanks so much for listening. Love y'all so much and have a great week.